Now I'd like to turn some time over to Jessica McQuig, uh, a graduate student in Dr. Michelle Boone's lab. Jessica is studying chytrid fungus, one of the greatest threats to amphibian populations worldwide. And Jessica is going to introduce tonight's highly anticipated speaker. Awesome, thank you, Steve. I really appreciate that. Um, it has been a great honor to get to know Dr. Caldwell a little bit today, particularly through our graduate student lunch, but I also feel like I've kind of gotten to know her um, by reading her, her recent book that Steve introduced us to. So she has had an amazing set of accomplishments that are truly inspiring. She got her bachelor's of science in bacteriology and her master's of science in genetics from Purdue University before going on to get a PhD in oceanography from the University of Washington. She went on to not only challenge what medical professionals understood about cholera, but to become a world leader in global infectious diseases, clean water, and human health. She's also become a prominent leader of many or scientific organizations, private foundations, and government agencies. She has an absolutely mind-boggling publication record, um, co-authoring over 800 scientific articles and at last count 19 or 20 books, which is just absolutely astounding. But what I'm kind of truly envious of is she also has a geologic site named after her in Antarctica, which I think is super cool. Um, so Dr. Colwell has impacted generations of Miami students through her prioritization of science education throughout her career. As the first director of the National Science Foundation, she emphasized science education at all levels from elementary school through graduate school education. She also co-chaired the Committee on, for Science um, for the National Science and Technology Council and many other advisory boards where she's always advocated for equality in science education and involvement in the entire scientific process because this is a process. The quality of Dr. Caldwell's personal research and the importance of her scientific breakthroughs is attested to by the 63 honorary degrees and numerous um, um, awards that have been bestowed upon her by prestigious institutions throughout the world. Her work on clean water uh, led to substantial reductions in cholera cases, particularly in the developing world, such as in rural Bangladesh, where she and her team implemented the use of low cost filters to remove waterborne pathogens. She's also assisted in bioterrorism research. And in 2008, she founded a bioinformatics company called Cosmos ID, um, which provides genomic sequencing resources for the microbiology field as a whole. Somehow though, during all of this, which astounds me even more, Dr. Caldwell also had the time to learn to race sailboats with her late husband, Jack. I'm not really sure where she finds the time and the energy to do all of these things, but as a grad student, I really have, have appreciated kind of learning a little bit about your process today. So maybe I can take on some of those pointers. So while her contributions to scientific research are astounding, and I've only just touched on a few of them, I also want to say that she's been in instrumental in helping science grow through her dedication to obtaining equal opportunities and treatment for women in science. In a recent book, which Steve has already introduced us to, A Lab of One's Own, A Woman's Personal Journey Through Sexism, Sexism in Science, she describes her personal battle to first just get the education that she deserved as a woman, but then from there to get the support the funding and the positions that would allow her to thrive and allow her science to be accessible to all of the to all of us. She profoundly said in her in her book that we need in order to address the problems that science faces today and in order to do the high quality science we need, we need to be searching 100% of the population for talent, not just 50% of the population. For that reason, women need the same equal opportunities as men. Dr. Caldwell fought this fight, fight, not just for herself, but also for me, for all the women scientists here, and for all of the women that will become scientists in the future. And for that, I profoundly thank you. So I'm grateful to Dr. Caldwell for pioneering work in both science and equality, that she's made the world a better place for all of us. And I'm really excited to hear what she has to say to us this evening. So thank you all for joining us today. And welcome, Dr. Caldwell. 
We're excited to hear about oceans, climate, and human health, what cholera teaches us about COVID-19. Well, thank you, Jessica, for a truly wonderful and very kind introduction, and Steve, for the great tour of the museum. You all are doing super work, and it's such a pleasure to uh, have an opportunity to uh, speak with you. I'm going to share the screen, and um, I guess the slides are up, are they? Very good. I, I'd like to share with you tonight uh, the work we've been doing uh, in Bangladesh, India, Far East, Latin America on cholera, and to use that to explain to you some of the current work that we're doing on tracking and predicting the risk of um, COVID-19, which we have all been suffering through for the past two years. And um, what I would like to see if I can get this to move forward. Um, some reason, I guess it lets me. Okay. Okay, now will it move? Good, good. Technology. I feel as though I have a Zoom chip embedded in my brain after a year and a half of Zoom talks. But I want to focus on <clears throat> waterborne diseases. And, and um, I've shown some of these slides earlier today to the um, science group, um, but I want to lay the groundwork of what cholera has taught us and how we have taken that information to understanding and predicting um, COVID-19 as a pandemic. Um, the waterborne diseases are significant because they really do affect millions of people every year, malaria, for example, almost um, 300, uh, 400 um, million individuals are infected. Uh, the diarrheal diseases, waterborne diseases, one and a half billion cases every year with almost 2 million deaths. So it's really a, a global disease, cholera. It's a, an acute water-related diarrheal disease. But I, I think what's been lost in the discussion about COVID-19 is that we've been in the seventh pandemic. We've been in, in a pandemic and currently in a second pandemic that's been ongoing since the 1960s. And that is cholera, which occurs year after year throughout the world. 50 countries are affected and about 7 million people on average. Um, Bangladesh and India have been considered recently that um, the source really of cholera, the homeland. But until about uh, 150 years ago, we had cholera in Canada, the US, Europe, in fact, in Washington, DC. Washington, DC, 200 years ago was known as a miasmic swamp because of malaria and yellow fever and cholera, uh, which were endemic. Of course, some might say it's still a miasmic swamp, but different reasons. Cholera bacteria, we discovered, exists naturally in aquatic in environments, in estuaries, in ponds, uh, rivers. Uh, the bacteria carry out carbon cycling, nitrogen cycling, and we discovered that the biotypes, the serotypes that we have ascribed to pandemic cholera, um, new biotypes have emerged. And so clearly from a number of reasons, cholera cannot be eradicated, but it clearly is controlled by safe water. With chlorination in the 1920s in the US, cholera and other dysentery-like diseases um, practically disappeared. Typhoid, for example, has not been a, um, an epidemic for at least 100 years. We did some early work in the Chesapeake Bay in the um, late 60s, early 70s, the team of students and postdoctoral fellows and visitor, visiting scientists. Those numbers are stations, which we every month, even today, would collect samples up and down the backbone of the Chesapeake Bay. And one of the studies um, culmination 
was that we discovered that the zooplankton, particularly copepods, carried the cholera bacteria. This was highly disputed. It was not accepted at all by the medical community 20 years ago. And this is the culprit. It's a copepod. In this case, it's a female copepod. And to the left, you can see the egg case. The bacteria coat the egg case, and it's fascinating. The vibrios are associated with the copepod in the gut, on the gills. They produce a very powerful proteolytic enzyme, which causes the egg case to break when it's ripe, and the eggs are cast into the water column. So there's this relationship of the bacteria with the copepod in its life cycle in the Chesapeake Bay. In addition, the Vibrio bacteria, including the cholera bacteria, have an enzyme, a chitinase, that breaks down that white hard shell that crabs and shrimp and copepods have. It's a polymer of N-acetylglucosamine. It's a hard shell structure, but the enzyme of these bacteria, including Vibrio coli, all Vibrios, breaks down the chitin. Otherwise, the Chesapeake Bay would be paved in uh, crab and uh, shrimp shells. We, we developed this model, this crude original model. This was in the 1970s. We hypothesized that in the spring, when the sun comes out, it's much warmer, lots of sunshine. That allows the phytoplankton, which carry chlorophyll, to bloom, that is to become very abundant. In fact, unfortunately, with polluted waters, we have algal blooms that are really toxic and uh, adverse to human health. But that's an aside. Right now, I want to discuss cholera. The zooplankton feed on the phytoplankton. And so when you have this grass of the ocean, the microscopic animals will then come in, feed on it, and become, a very, become very abundant. When they have depleted the food supply, they then will die, will be cast off, and release the vibrios. And then if you drink water that has not been purified, treated properly, chlorinated, then you will come down with cholera. So the cholera um, victims then will shed the bacteria in large numbers via feces in unsanitary conditions. So that was the crude model we developed about 40 years ago. We were criticized that, well, this was very interesting for the Chesapeake Bay, but did that really make any difference in Bangladesh? Was that the way it was there? Because you see, scientists working with the World Health Organization had actually published a book. Uh, Politzer was the scientist who was the editor of the book a very thick book, about an inch thick, of studies done on cholera, including enormous numbers of studies trying to isolate the bacteria from the environment, but without success. Because what we had discovered in our work in the 1960s and 70s and 80s was that the bacteria in the environment, when they are outside of their host, they go dormant and they can't be readily cultured. And it took detection with DNA probes and fluorescent antibody to be able to see them. We did our work, we were challenged to show that what we had learned in the Chesapeake Bay really took place in Bangladesh. So in 1975, I accepted the challenge and began my work in Bangladesh and have gone there many times a year until, of course, COVID hit when no one was traveling. But it became very clear that taking water from ponds like this one, typical, not purified in any way, collecting it in those aluminum kaloshes, the women would carry the water up to their huts and houses for the family for drinking water or cooking water for the day. It turned out, of course, that um, we could pick up the bacteria 
in the environment, predominantly on the copepods, but also some of the other uh, biota would have some of the bacteria on it, but really predominantly it was associated with the copepods. Now, the medical community determines that person-to-person -person transmission was the mode of infection. And because they couldn't isolate the bacteria from the environment by the culture technique using petri dishes and agar, we were able to demonstrate the bacteria were present and that in fact it is the environment that is the source of the cholera bacteria in conditions of poor sanitation and without access to safe drinking water. The other aspect of it that was really intriguing was that in 1983 or 84, NASA, the National Aeronautics and Space Administration, launched a satellite, Landsat, that had sensors that could measure chlorophyll and sea surface temperature and sea surface height. Well, the relationship of these environmental parameters intrigued me. And I concluded and did the work with a NASA team that we should be able to predict when and where and how intense a cholera epidemic would be. And so we carried out the studies with Dr. Lobitz and um, the team at um, the, um, the um, Goddard Space Center and also with the NASA team in California. This work we did show that indeed, if you could control or actually calculate the time and correct for the time for the chlorophyll uh, carrying plankton to become very dominant in the early spring, and then the uh, animal component of plankton to feed on the phytoplankton, and then release the vibrios into the water column to be drunk by the villagers without the purification of water, with that correction, it fit dramatically. This, this was published 20 years ago. And it's literally the satellite sensing, the blue line is the satellite sensing of the sea surface temperature in the Bay of Bengal. And the red line are the actual cholera cases in Bangladesh, at that particular time, we had taken a quadrant of water just off the, the, um, the Bangladesh coast, uh, which was a crude estimate, but that was the best we could do at that time and make that correlation. This was quite dramatic. So significantly so that for Calcutta or Kolkata as it's now known, for every milligram per cubic meter increase in chlorophyll, there would be a 33% increase in the number of cholera cases. And for every millimeter per day increase in rainfall during the monsoon, you would have 7% increase in the number of cholera cases in Calcutta. And similarly in Matla, the village where we did our work in Bangladesh. We have since improved our model significantly. We now know from work done in uh, India uh, from the records of, of the British colonials from 1823 to about 1950, that this relationship with rainfall and uh, poor sanitation, um, particularly if it's been preceded by very warm temperatures, that then there would be a very high risk of cholera. And in addition, we've been able to utilize a whole bevy of satellite sensors that have been launched in the last um, uh, 40 years. It's been quite amazing. Our first work was done with Landsat back in uh, 1996 and uh, published in 2000. We've, sudden, we've su subsequently been able to pick up additional satellites to the present where we now have been able to develop a real-time cholera prediction model utilizing the what were classified satellites and then 
released for public use that can actually monitor now to a square meter of water to measure chlorophyll and temperature, et cetera, as well as the movement of individuals in a given area. So taking all this new data into account, we've been able to develop a really powerful predictive model. Now I'm showing here Hurricane Matthew, which traversed Haiti, created devastation, and it moved on up along the coast of the United States. This was um, 2015. We used that hurricane and the cholera um, that it would cause in Haiti to calculate our prediction model for cholera shown to the left. And the actual cholera cases in 2015, following Hurricane Matthew, is shown on the right. And in that uh, five or six years ago, was about 60 or 70% accurate. But we have since improved the model. And here is shown um, the cholera that occurred uh, in Yemen in 2017. The outbreak was ferocious, millions of cases of cholera because of the civil war, uh, the social um, discontent and disruption. Our model shown in the blue, red, and green showed the in red where the cholera cases would be most likely, the risk would be highest. And you can see from the lower right, that is in fact where the cholera cases were occurring. Now we quickly published this um, work in 2017. It was picked up by Scientific American, a little paragraph appeared saying that cholera could be predicted uh, by satellite sensing and uh, uh, related techniques in, in uh, Yemen. And a colleague in, who worked for the British Aid Agency called us literally on the telephone uh, in January of 2018 and said, look, if you can make those predictions, could you give us a four week a warning of the risk of cholera specifically geographically located. And we said, yes, we will. So we worked together during 2018 and we were able to provide um, every month a two week ahead of time prediction in 2018. And the British Aid Agency and the uh, UNICEF, the Children's Organization of the UN used our results to locate physicians, medical supplies, and safe water for drinking. We were able to reduce significantly cholera in Yemen in 2018. Now, let me turn very briefly to DNA sequencing because it plays a role both in tracking cholera, but also, as I will show, in our application to COVID-19. Our technique is that we have developed over the last um, 12, 15 years is to be able to extract DNA from water, from um, sewage, from uh, clinical samples, from blood, urine. Um, and the extracted DNA is sequenced on any sequencer, doesn't matter which one, it's agnostic. And we have built uh, a very elegant, highly curated, removing all the contamination database for bacteria, viruses, fungus, and parasites. This allows us then to identify everything in a given sample, bacteria, viruses, fungus, parasites, as well as the genes that they carry coding for antibiotic resistance and for pathogenicity properties and for metabolic properties, such as the um, ability to break down sugars and car other carbohydrates, uh, proteins, et cetera. So this is a, an identification and a um, pathogen characterization scheme. But the key point is that we can identify right down to strain very accurately. And one example, which we have done 
with Orange County, California. As you know, California has been suffering until recently, until the last few weeks, from a very severe drought leading to wildfires, etc. And in Los Angeles, the Orange County Water District, they have had to draw on the water from the sewage treatment plant to be brought into, piped into the water treatment plant. So half the water in the water treatment plant coming in is from the river and groundwater. And the other half is the secondary effluent, the sludge of course being shipped out, piped out to sea. And the water comes into the sewage treatment plant. We worked with them uh, on a study funded by the National Science Foundation to examine the efficacy, the effectiveness of the water treatment and the safety of the output. And the water goes through very extensive treatment. Um, it is uh, first um, mixed with sodium hypochlorite, a microfiltration, um, and then um, reverse osmosis, uh, UV irradiation, and subsequently it goes on to chlorination and additional treatment before being released. And um, we were able to show that the input water, that is all of this gray area, this is water with all of these kinds of bacteria, uh, some pathogenic and most not, but many bacteria. But by the time it goes through millipore filtration, the yellow is all that the kinds of bacteria that are present. And then when it goes through reverse osmosis, the only bacteria we pick up are the water bacteria that are present in um, any bottled water or tap water uh, because water that we drink from the fountain is not sterile, but it's free of pathogens. And that's the key point. Similarly with viruses, we were able to show, we were able to show that initially the input water carries um, adenovirus and a few human pathogen type virus. And a lot of the agriculturally important viruses like the pepper mild motile virus, which affects pepper plants. It's commonly found in sewage. But by the time it goes through the treatment, the only viruses that we pick up are bacterial uh, phages, the viruses that affect bacteria, but not humans. And so you can see from the chart that by the, the Q1 water coming in from the sewage plant, uh, by the time it goes through millipore filtration, there's a release of viruses, but by the time it goes through reverse osmosis, there is a significant reduction. And by the time it is gone through the entire treatment, the only viruses are the occasional bacterial virus, nothing else. There was a very big concern that with this mixing of sewage uh, water with uh, groundwater, we would be transferring antibiotic resistance to the groundwater bacteria, but we were able to show that that's not the case because we can detect the presence of the antibiotic resistance coding genes. We could show that indeed the water coming in from the sewage treatment plant had abundant antibiotic resistance genes, but by the time it's gone through millipore filtration and reverse osmosis, the only antibiotic resistance is that which is normally associated with the, the um, uh, water bacteria normally found in the clean, unpolluted environment. For the, for the, I've become very interested in drinking water and the microbiome of drinking water. And we've done studies of bottled water that we bought from some of the um, markets where you have uh, um, fancy kinds of uh, drinking water, bottled spring water, artesian water, tap water that you simply go into a, a supermarket and pick up the bottled water, the least expensive in the plastic containers. And then we also tested tap water, uh, that is just turning on the faucet in the house and uh, drinking water from a, a fountain, in this case, at one, of the, one of the dormitories. Interestingly, these kinds of water have their own microbiome. 
here is shown the kind of uh, microbiome, the bacteria that you would find in bottled water in the supermarket. This represents the um, microbiome of mineral water. And this represents tap water and uh, drinking fountain water carries a slightly different um, microbial content. But fortunately, no indicator bacteria, no E. coli, no enterococci, and um, uh, the antibiotic resistance markers, we didn't pick, pick, them, pick them up. The only viruses we picked up were the bacterial viruses, not pathogenic for humans. And this very unusual archaeal ancient DNA carried by some bacteria was detected only in natural mineral water, safe bacteria, nothing pathogenic. So predominantly tap water, uh, bottled water contained just the normal water that you would find in clean, unpolluted areas. Very interesting. Now, what has all this got to do with COVID-19? We now know so much, in the, unfortunately, uh, in the last almost two years. We know that the bacteria, um, I'm sorry, the, the virus, the virus in this case, um, attaches to the ACE2 receptor site, which is present on the surface of the lungs, the liver, the kidneys, the intestines, and the virus even traverses to the brain where we now know that the symptoms are lack of smell, loss of smell, and loss of taste. Um, so this is a, an insidious virus. Because of the work we have done with the identification of uh, bacteria, virus, fungus, and protists, we were able to determine very early, way back in January, well, more like February and March of 2020, that we could identify the SARS CoV virus and its variants uh, or the strains of it um, by the method, this uh, next generation sequencing method and algorithm that we had developed. Other scientists very early on showed that about half of COVID victims, whether or not they had symptoms or not, would shed the virus in the stool. Now, what was important was, now this looks like a complicated slide, it's not. These are patients, one, two, three, all the way down to 41. And horizontally, the red line indicates that that individual throat swab was positive. But notice, throat swab's positive, but this yellow line indicates stool is positive. So long after the throat swab is negative, the victim will be continuing to shed the virus in the stool. We have taken this to a practical application. In June, we contacted and began work with, through the governor's office in the state of Maryland, the testing of wastewater samples as a means for a, an early warning of a community outbreak of COVID. And in fact, starting in June of 2020, in this case in Frederick, Maryland, we, we used two detectors. In this case, we were using uh, a target gene and PCR, but we have also done next generation sequencing, and I'll speak of that in a minute. But we used two set of target genes recommended, the end target gene recommended by CDC, and then the ORF1 uh, uh, target gene so we could confirm that we were really picking up the virus. Now remember, this was in the beginning of the epidemic in April, May, June of 2020, when we were just beginning to understand that we were in for a bad siege. And by July, we picked up a peak in numbers, very large numbers of virus um, per liter of wastewater. 
And that was connected to subsequent patients about five to seven days later being recorded in Frederick, Maryland. So this was an early warning mechanism for community identification, detection of virus cases, a kind of early prediction. And this is important because this is non-invasive. We're not working with an individual and it, there's a, um, a, a protection of privacy because we're not targeting anybody. We're simply measuring the virus in the community. One case study proved to be very illustrative of the value of this approach. We began twice weekly sampling dormitories effluent at Saint, Mount St. Mary's University in Maryland. We, we tested the, the, the wastewater from the outlet for each dormitory. In one of the dormitories, we tested all the students in that dormitory. We found 10 were positive, nine were asymptomatic. We were able then to notify the university, they were able to quarantine those 10 individuals and um, uh, test the rest in the building on a regular basis. And they did not have to close down the university and they didn't have to close even the dormitory because they were able to monitor it before it had spread to the rest of the students in that dormitory. An example of the value of this testing. What we have done, which is even more exciting, is we've taken the model for predicting cholera. We have modified it to include the parameters like dew point temperature, humidity, cell phone traffic of movement of individuals to be able to build a cholera risk map. This is the risk map to the left for April, May, 2020 over a year, almost two years ago. And the actual cases on the right, this was our crude first attempt and it was about 60% accurate. We now have a risk map that can be accessed on a monthly basis. This is as of October um, this year, the risk map of COVID for the United States. And Every month, this is updated um, by going to that particular website. And so that has allowed us to be able to predict COVID. Let me close. I showed this earlier to my science group, but let me close by saying that science needs to be socially responsible and responsive. Working in Bangladesh now for almost 40 years, there are villages that still don't have access to safe water. In fact, these, these boats are homes for families with children. And here are the houses on the, they're on earth, it's on the, on the ground, they're on the ground, but all take their water from the river and from ponds. What we did was figure that we had shown that these copepods predominantly carried the bacteria. If we could filter the copepods and the particulate, particulate matter out of the water, we could reduce cholera because it had been shown by others, not by us, but about 50 years ago, studies at the University of Maryland, a team had shown with volunteers that it took about a million Vibrio cholerae bacteria per teaspoon of water to induce a case of cholera. And then if you had ingested only maybe a hundred or 10 or a few cells, you might have one incident of diarrhea or you might vomit, but that would be it. You wouldn't be debilitated and death threatened 
from the severe loss of water or fluid and the sodium potassium uh, breakdown uh, in your um, uptake of liquid. So that if we could do that, we would then protect these individual um, uh, citizens and, and uh, inhabitants uh, in, in Bangladesh. We did the experiment in the laboratory. We tested men's t-shirt. We, we tested whatever anybody could get their hands on in Bangladesh without paying a lot of money. Uh, we tested sari cloth, bright new fancy sari cloth. Um, we tested um, Chinese poplin, which the most wealthy could buy. And we found that the old sari cloth used as dust rags served as a very nice filter. Folded about four to five or six times, it provided, we tested this by the electron microscope, about a 20 micrometer mesh filter. Copepods are 200 to 300 micrometer big in size. So they would be trapped on the folded sari cloth. We proposed to NIH to do a study. Well, we were rejected. One of the reviewers said that men would not drink sari water passing through sari cloth, which was unclean. We turned to the um, Thrasher Foundation and bless them. They gave us $100,000 to do a pilot study. One of the things we discovered doing this pilot study for three months to determine whether this would be an adopted procedure, we discovered that men had been using sari cloth to filter flies from their beer. So much for the reviewer. In any case, we then returned to NIH with our preliminary data and we were funded for a three year study to work in Bangladesh. And what we did was use some of the funds to train women to be extension agents to go out and train the women in the villages. And this was very fortuitous because when we started the work, the women who served as essentially homeopathic, that is the, they would provide um, roots and herbs and so forth. And they were afraid that we were going to cut into their business. So what we did was to hire those women, train them, and they became our extension agents. And they were wonderful. And we were able to train um, several thousand villagers to use filtered water, <clears throat> whereby you would take a yard of sari cloth, preferably used sari cloth that you're going to throw away anyway, fold it four or five times, put it over the kalash, collect your water by filtering it through that crude filter. And um, it was easy to explain this was a good thing to do because this is the filtered water. This is the pond water with all sorts of things swimming in it. And by this technique, we were able to reduce with sari cloth filters, even better than the expensive nylon filters that we also had tested, about 50% reduction in cholera in, in those villages in Bangladesh. So as John Muir, the founder of the Sierra Club, um, said, when one tugs at a single thing in nature, he, and I've inserted and she, find it hitched to the rest of the universe. Many students, colleagues from Bangladesh, Calcutta, India, students at the University of Maryland and postdocs and visiting scientists, colleagues from many countries, Korea, Argentina, uh, England, Mexico, with whom we have worked over the years, have helped us develop this understanding of cholera, its prediction, and now its application to COVID-19. Water is one of the major threats with climate change, and we will have to deal with providing safe water because there are a billion people today who do not have access 
to save water. And that will increase if we don't work to provide safe water as climate change wreaks its vengeance. You've heard the book uh, mentioned and written in the book is how the cholera work was done and other stories. So I thank you, I'll stop sharing. And thank you for the opportunity to speak with you and happy to answer any questions that you may have wanted to um, ask. Well, that was fabulous. Thank you for that talk. Uh, so much interesting information and, and uh, clear graphs to support that. I think that's wonderful. Uh, if people would like to, they can, may type their questions into the chat and then also uh, type questions into YouTube, which we will then uh, also read off here. The first question uh, Nancy Solomon has, let me bring that back up. Whoops. Yeah, I saw that. It was, uh, what is sari cloth made of? Yeah. Good, very good question. Very good question. It's cloth. It's literally cloth. It's woven cloth. Um, and um, it, it's available uh, very inexpensively. It's what women use as their clothing. The uh, village women who, are, who don't have very much money at all will use this cloth, this very inexpensive cheap cloth, to make saris that they use for dress. So it's it's essentially a cotton or a cotton poly blend that's woven about the consistency of, of bed sheets, right? Uh, no, it's even thinner than that. It's more like a cotton wool, a cotton um, uh, mesh. Um, um, what do you call it? Um, it's used for band aids. It's it's more okay. like that. So so really, just filtering out the big stuff takes care of the majority of the problem. Yes, because the, the bacteria are attached to particulates and to the, the zooplankton. A few cells will come through. It's, it doesn't sterilize it. But as I said, the studies have been done that show you don't get a full-blown cholera by just one or two cells ingested. For sure. And a lot of those zooplankton are, are large enough to use as fish food, at least in the aquarium industry. So they're, you know, they're big enough to see and relatively easy to filter out, it sounds like. Uh, Bill Cam wants to know, has your research been used to study other waterborne illnesses? Uh, yes, we, we have evidence that, um, that this filtration also worked for e some of the infectious E. coli. And um, so uh, it has been used as a, as a general disinfectant, but we, I can't claim it because we didn't design our experiments to deal with these other pathogens. So I'm only reporting on what we actually designed, controlled for, and, and were able to prove that we were getting the results. Sure. Julie Robinson is asking about, while you are doing all of this water testing, certainly there will be some bacteria or viruses that have never yet been identified. Is there a way to know what proportion of your samples includes things like that? Well, yes, we've done extensive work on the microbiome uh, of the filtrate, and we're in the process now of writing that up because we're finding that we can pick up variants of Vibrio cholerae, which um, would not be picked up because if you're working with a given serotype, you wouldn't see that there are all these other Vibrio cholerae present as well, strains of Vibrio cholerae. So it's proven to be a pretty um, sophisticated tool, despite the fact that it's a primitive filter <laughs> approach. Sure. Along those same lines, we've, we've heard recently in the news, uh, people have contracted myelodosis from fish tank water, uh, and then more recently from aromatherapy sprays that apparently have rocks in them. How, how dangerous is this random things like this being introduced into our environment? I think we need to be careful. Um, very, and it, it, there is a really need for regulation um, because without it, uh, you know, in an anything goes world, uh, you're going to be susceptible to all kinds of infection. So I think that it, it would be sensible, I think, to do an analysis to see what is there. And now that we can detect and identify viruses as well, uh, in fact, we're doing that 
uh, we're just now writing up the um, complete analysis of wastewater because it's going to be kind of important if we have a uh, influenza epidemic coming up to be able to see what the relationship is with COVID. And so being able to detect both the influenza and the COVID and any other viruses that are present, this gives the public health folks a leg up, a, a kind of an advance on what may be coming through the community. Uh, we now know it's about five days. We've done extensive work with um, the experts uh, who know the sewage flow and it's about five day early warning. And, and it's, it's so amazing to me that techniques such as the ones that you work with uh, are so rapid at this point. We can see things so quickly and in such minute quantities. Exactly. Nancy Solomon has a question, changing gears slightly. When you were in college and graduate school, were there any female professors in your science departments? And then as a follow-up to that question, did you decide to continue on with your education uh, because of their, their work, their examples, or simple fascination, et cetera? It's, it's, um, those are really good questions. There was one, one, uh, and she was fabulous. I got to take her course in my senior year and that's when I turned to bacteriology. She was really a superb teacher. Um, and I write about her in the book. Um, I started out to, to go to medical school. I'd been accepted to medical school. I applied to three and I was accepted to all three, including Yale. But I met this handsome graduate student in March of my senior year. And uh, Jack was on his way to his PhD and had spent a year studying and I didn't want him to lose that time. And so we thought, well, why don't we both get masters and then I'll go on to med school uh, wherever he goes to do his PhD in physical chemistry. Well, it didn't quite work out that way because he uh, was accepted at the University of Washington in a superb uh, uh, chemistry department. And so I applied to the University of Washington Medical School, but I was told, uh, Yes, we accept you. And then I got another letter that said, oops, you're not a resident. You don't pay taxes in Washington state. Therefore, we can't admit you until you've been around for a year. But if you want to work in microbiology, we'll give you a, a fellowship. So that's how I ended up um, in microbiology. Uh, no regrets, none whatsoever. I did get into a tussle, found myself between two feuding professors and uh, ended up becoming a marine microbiologist, which at the time was obscure and no one really wanted to study marine bacteria. But now, of course, it's a hot subject. So I kind of landed on my feet despite all these zigzags in my career. That, that anecdote uh, touches on some things that came up at the lunch today and that also came up in one of my own classes a few weeks ago where students oftentimes feel like they, when they declare a major or they tell their parents what they're gonna do when they grow up, they have to be stuck in that. Uh, how, how do you feel about the, the perceived need to choose a point and simply progress straight towards that? No, you have, I think you have to be prepared. First of all, um, when you graduate, half of what you've been taught is already obsolete. So you need to be ready to always be a learner, someone who can learn whatever the new things coming up. And the technology that's going to change your life as a graduate uh, from uh, Miami University in the coming uh, months um, is, is technology that even hasn't been invented yet. So you may change your career at least a dozen times before you retire. I, in my age group, uh, we started out with whatever we found interesting and we were able to have a complete career in that subject. But students today will not because technology, science, discovery is so rapid, so constant, and you need to be flexible. 
So along these lines, one of our viewers wants to know, uh, what motivated you to push forward with your education and your studies in a society or culture that told you that you just didn't belong in that field? I'm very stubborn <laughs> and I love books. In fact, when I was in the fourth grade, um, the teacher was terrific. Uh, and she, she had a bunch of books. She said, if you read four of those books, you get to keep one of them. So that was a, an incentive that I thought was great. So as you can see from my background, that I'm, in, I'm at home and um, the house uh, is covered with books because I love books. So I just persevered, I was determined. There were things I wanted to do. There were things I wanted to uh, discover uh, and I was not going to be impeded. Um, fortunately, I married the right guy and the two of us embarked on a, on a life of uh, learning, adventure, and a lot of fun. That's great. Uh, another viewer is interested to know, uh, Kevin Mat Madison wants to know, are the COVID risk maps that you shared also being used in the New York Times and other outlets, or how do they differ? Um, the New York Times depends on the maps produced by Johns Hopkins. Um, and uh, the Hopkins are numbers of cases. What we're producing is the risk based on climate, weather, uh, dew point, humidity, um, movement of populations indoors, outdoors, a lot of these sociological behavioral patterns as well. So it's slightly different, but valuable. Sure. All right. Well, it looks like we may have reached the end of our questions. This has been an inspiring day. You've, uh, I think it's been a, a, a long day for you especially. We really appreciate all of the time that Dr. Caldwell has, has devoted to Miami University. Uh, she's, she's met with uh, probably at this point 150 people or so in a, in a relatively personal capacity, not to mention the hundreds that have attended our various uh, broadcasts of both your, uh, your lunch, your technical seminar, and then this final lecture today. So we really appreciate all of your time. And uh, I, I think I, I, I especially appreciate the fact that you've recorded your thoughts and your experiences in books like this that are, are both so readable and so impactful. And I encourage everybody to, to get a copy. I know it's, uh, it must be popular with people more than just us because I know it's in, in paperback as well now. Uh, Let me uh, thank the Hefner uh, Foundation for making the Hefner Lecture is possible. I think it's been great. I've enjoyed it immensely and I've enjoyed meeting everybody. So my thanks to you all too for inviting me. Well, thank you. We, we are blessed to be here on a campus with so many great people surrounding us and, and, and uh, such a great cohort of students, especially right now after COVID. Everybody's so engaged and it's a lot of fun. Terrific. Where I'm seeing a lot of, of thank yous in the, in the chat here and a lot of people that attended all three of your presentations today. So thank you so much. Thank you. Cheerio. We'll sign off now. Good night. Good night. Well, thank you, Jessica and Carla and all of the people who attended today and for Julie managing all of the logistics and uh, the lunch today. And thanks especially to all of our donors and supporters that make everything we do here at the Hefner possible. Thanks for attending and good night.